My name's Kathleen Hulser, and uh, I'm going to be talking about a project that I've volunteered with for a long time. And I actually uh, managed to set my uh, virtual background here, so it looks like I am myself in Juvie, a very old campus on the Hudson River. It was called the Hudson Girls Training School, and it was open from 1904 to 1975. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, shortly. Um, and maybe I'll get some slides on this, and maybe I won't. We'll see. But basically, the project is called incorrigibles. Incorrigible is a word that was used to describe girls that were sent to this institution. And if you remember when you were a gal teen, uh, it might have been an experience that in your heart you shared, even if you didn't have the bad luck to get sent to a juvenile institution. So basically, how the society saw us was as wild, unruly, defiant, wayward, maybe delinquent, certainly disobedient, incorrigible, a word used by the courts and on the forms up until very recently, and ungovernable. And I always like to juxtapose with this how we saw ourselves, which is quite different from how the courts and the parents and the society in general saw us. And how we saw ourselves was as free-spirited, courageous, determined, imaginative, surviving, strong, proud, and free. And that is um, the sort of basic parameters. So the website is at incorrigibles.org. And you can listen to stories of girls who were at this institution when it was open. You can also see a video, which is pretty nice there, that we made about the project. And you can see links to today's activism with young girls who are being affected by the system of mass incarceration, which has uh, unfortunately embraced girls in a big way in the last generation. So founded by Allison Cornyn, the project gives a voice to girls who have been locked up pushed around and silenced so often in our past. And I want to underline in particular for the audience here that this silencing by shutting girls up in institutions is uh, something that is very important. And we need to emphasize that teenage girls count too and their voices should be heard. So this reformatory operated on a cottage system and the cottages uh, the girls lived in were run by house parents. So the institution itself saw itself as a reform uh, creating a better space. That is, it separated girls from older women and it didn't put them in prison. And basically the people who were there, girls who were there, uh, there were about 15,000 in the 70 years history that were sent there and they were aged 12 to 18. And one of the things that's kind of unusual about this girl juvenile institution scene is that if you're convicted of something on the outside, you know, you'll get a sentence. You get like six months probation if you're caught shoplifting, maybe. Nice. Yeah, so you can now see it. And the URL is at the bottom here. And uh, Here's a view of the institution. This is girls exercising in the lawn uh, very early on. So they have those uh, 19th century uh, uh, white uniforms that were used to exercise in long skirts and so on. Uh, here's the cottages that I was just about to talk about, the cottage system where girls were supposedly confined in a family-like environment, although that's certainly disputed by people who were there. The educational system wasn't really school in the early years. It was more scrub brush than pencil. And uh, what you would learn is not so much reading, writing, and arithmetic, but how to obey, a primary lesson, and cooking, cleaning, and um, sometimes a bit of woodworking. So one of my favorite shots is of the some furniture that the girls made, but that was relatively little. The beauty parlor was really active in the early days of this institution too. So they had gender stereotype ways of uh, thinking about what education might be. Um, let, just to mention, our website is incorrigibles.org, and you can listen to oral histories from women who were confined there. You can see a video history. You can learn about girls' confinement in general, 
and you can share your story if you happen to have one of being locked up yourself. And you can also link to today's act activism. So here's a chart of some of the work treatments and you see that cooking, beauty, parlor, laundry, and cleaning particularly made up the bulk of the assignments. Here's the big one, 94 girls at the time there were uh, on cleaning duty. They cleaned the house of the superintendent there. Um, this was a, a room with some furniture that they made. They made the uh, stool and the chest and the uh, chair with the um, bow back. So reform ideas were always changing and whatever is happening with these girls is something that uh, is still happens today, which is that the gender norms, you didn't have to commit a crime to get sent there. If you happen to get pregnant, you might get sent there. If your boyfriend beat you up or your stepfather sexually abused you, you could get sent there. Nothing would happen to him. And uh, this is partially because if you are disobedient and you're under the age of 18, the courts have the right to confine you for being incorrigible, as they called it. Uh, Jan Kerouac, the daughter of Jack Kerouac, was one of the people who was sent there. And she was uh, pretty clever and her mother was too. And uh, so she got herself out uh, by not flunking the urine test. This was in the um, 60s. Uh, by having her mother substitute her uh, urine for Jan. So she didn't spend too, too long there. But the um, acceptable behaviors was something that got you in there much more than doing something, you know, really wrong, like, I don't know, violence, say, not much violent crime, staying out too late, dating the wrong boy, or getting pregnant, all of which are not crimes, Solitary confinement was used extensively. Uh, this is a photo by Marion Palfrey, a really wonderful photographer of the 40s. And uh, the punishment there was pretty severe. If you made a fuss after you were locked up, they'd take your clothes away. Next, they'd take your sheets away. Then um, they wouldn't let you out for the bathroom and you had to like pee in a bucket that they put in there. So um, it was pretty draconian. One of my uh, least favorite punishments was talked about in some of the early uh, history of this institution. And this is uh, plastering the girl's mouth shut when she used bad words. So I don't know if anybody out there has ever used unladylike language, but I know I'm a really huge candidate for having a plaster made of this asafetida and newts vomica and stinking weed. And then they would take the plaster off so you could eat. I mean, that was one of the shocking things that I read in the documents when researching this. Racial segregation was also in effect there, and Ella Fitzgerald was the most famous person we know of who was sent there. Uh, she was living with her uh, stepfather, and apparently uh, things were going south. And she, her, the cottages were stopped being segregated after the 30s, but the story that always um, impressed me was there's a church up the hill where the girls sang in a choir, and uh, that was uh, forbidden to her because uh, she was black. So they missed out on a really good voice there with, at the very least. So um, there were also uh, secret codes of language there, which I find really fun and interesting. Uh, Holland, H-O-L-L-A-N-D, was a way of signing a letter, which means hope our love lasts and never dies. 7-Eleven means I hope. Uh, 500 meant always, 225 meant never. Uh, so anyway, there was somebody who studied this place and like many uh, teens, the girls had their own secret language. So basically, um, I'm gonna end here and invite you to visit the website and to think about the ways in which our gender norms have set up rules that are very different for men and women and boys and girls and to think about the way in which defiance of those rules might be a strength rather than a drawback. Thank you. Incorrigibles.org, founded by artist Allison Cornyn. And I'm a historian, Kathleen Hulser, and have worked on this project for eight years or so.